here at all once again tonight. I'm glad that you're with us. Continuing our study of the book of Romans, today is the first day of the week, so we are assembled together to study and to worship the God of heaven and spirit and the truth. We're continuing this study, and I pray that it's been a beneficial study for all of you. I have certainly learned a lot. I think that you have also. I think that as we go through this, and that every time that we go over this on Sunday nights, we go through and we give basic an outline of the entire book of Romans up to the point we're studying. I don't know about you, but before I, I we started this lesson, uh, I had read the book of Romans, obviously, before and, and, and various times, but there's a lot of the in-depth things that I did not know that I do now, and I'm praying that you're also getting a lot out of this. Uh, these are very, this is a very valuable book. This is um, considered by most to be a masterpiece of God by the pen of, of Paul uh, regarding the obedience of faith and regarding the gospel system. And if you notice the book of Hebrews, and if you notice the book of Galatians, you see similarities in this, and the theme of that, and that is God's power to save is the gospel, the gospel is superior, the new covenant. And that is, again, what is being focused on. So, let us go and outline this book before we get into the lesson tonight. We'll outline the first ten chapters. And then we'll look at number uh, chapter 11, and we'll go through, and we'll touch a few high points, and then we will get into verses 34 and 36, and we'll actually finish chapter 11 tonight. And that will bring us to chapter 12. And, he, and Brother Lee and I were talking this morning uh, regarding uh, Titus chapter 2 and how it transitions right into Titus chapter 3 and verse 1. And we had reminded each other that God didn't put this chapter in it. That was man. That was added by man to help uh, break it down into and, and book chapter and verses and, and various things of that nature. But we have to understand that all of these are related. So as we go through chapter 11 tonight, guess what? It's going to transition right into chapter 12 mm -hmm. next week, and you're going to see the relation. So, Book of Romans. Book of Romans, chapter 1, verse number 5. We speak of obedient faith. Romans chapter 16 and verse 26, we have the concept of obedient faith. Any faith that is pleasing to God is an obedient faith, James 2, 20 through 26. Without faith, it is impossible to please God. Hebrews 11 and verse 6. Faith cometh by hearing and hearing by the word of God. Romans 10 and verse 17. Therefore, we get, uh, we, we understand what we are to do by God's word and we act upon it. Romans 1 and verse 7, Paul was writing to the saints in Rome. The principles, it was written for us, it was recorded for us, we understand that, but it was written to them. And it would behoove us to keep that in mind regarding context. The book is themed in what two verses? Chapter 1, verses 16 and 17. For I am not ashamed of the gospel of Christ. It is the power of God and salvation unto all those who believe. What is Paul just established? What has God established through Paul just then? The gospel is a universal system. The patriarchal age was limited to a family. The patriarch of the family would offer on behalf of his family, and he was the priest for the family. You can see that in Job chapter 1. He would offer for his family in case they cursed God. He was their patron. The nation of Israel was just that. It was a national religion. It was based upon lineage, and that is Jacob or Israel's sons. The gospel. It is the power of God unto all those that believe. To the Jew first and also to the Greek. For therein is the righteousness of God revealed. Well, does the gospel reveal that God is righteous? Yes. But that's not what's being spoken of. What is being spoken of is God's way to make man righteous. It is revealed in the gospel. It is the power of God and the salvation of all those who believe. The Jew first and also to the Greek. For therein is the righteousness of God revealed from faith to faith. As it is written, the just shall live by faith. Paul said in 2 Corinthians 5 verse 7, but we walk by faith. Same principle. It's a quote from a book. Chapter 2. So, we have that theme in Romans 1, 16 and 17. Now, verses 18 through 32 take us through the ancient Gentiles and some of the sins that they were guilty of. The United States, by and large, is guilty of the same sins. To a great degree. And guess what verse 32 shows? Verse 32 shows that not only those who participate, but those who love them will promote those that do. All of the gay marriage promoters, all of the Islam promoters, all of these individuals are guilty too. If you don't stand for it, guess what? You're complicit to it. 
chapter 2. The nation of Israel is under condemnation. Why? Verse 13. For hearers of the law are not just before God, but doers of the law shall be justified. Romans 3 and verse 2 says that the nation of Israel had the oracles of God. But they were guilty. Why? Because they failed to keep them. What was the law? The law was a standard. We mentioned this morning, Galatians 3.24, that it was a schoolmaster that would bring individuals to understand their need to be saved because guess what? You're not good enough. <coughs> when they would try to keep the law and all of its 600 and some odd ordinances, and they failed and they had to make an offering and they saw this animal's blood being shed, would it not let them realize, would it not let them know, you know what, you have to offer this every year, over and over, you're not good enough. They would see the bloodshed, they would recognize that a life had to be paid for their sin. That should have brought them to the realization, you know what, Jesus Christ came and he died for me. All I have to do is obey the gospel and be faithful to him and give up this dead law. Well, they didn't do it. It was a standard and they failed. Romans 3. All of sin. Romans 3 verse 19 says, For whatsoever the law saith, it saith them under the law, that every mouth may be stopped. That all shall be guilty or condemned before God. Every man. The gospel is for how many? The gospel is for all. Jew and Gentile. Why? Because every man's guilty. Every man needs saving. If you need saving, you're not saved, are you? If you, if you need saving, then you must be guilty. If you're guilty, you must be under law. What law? Not necessarily the law of Moses, unless you were a Jew. But you are under law to God. What is the universal law given, beginning in Acts 2 onward? What is that law? Law to Christ, 1 Corinthians 9, 21. James 1, 25. The law of liberty. So, they were guilty. Now look, Romans 3, beginning in verse 20. You now see, around verse 21 and 22, that there is now a righteousness, the righteousness of God, being apart from the law, but witnessed by it. That's the gospel. Righteousness of God in the book of Romans means what? The gospel of Christ. They're synonymous. It's the same thing. You can reference Romans 1, 16 and 17. You can see that. You'll see it also in Romans chapter 10. Righteousness of God in this context is dealing with the gospel. God's way to make man righteous. So, Romans chapter 3, verse 23, all of sin and fall short of the glory of God. Verse 24, being justified freely by His grace through the redemption that is found in the denominational church. You all should be looking up at me right now saying, I don't think so. You're right. Being justified freely by His grace through the redemption that is found in Christ. How do you get in Christ? Oh, that's easy. Repent, be baptized, every one of you, in the name of Jesus Christ, for the remission of sin. You are baptized into Christ, Galatians 3, 26 and 27 says. That means, if you do so, then you are a son of God by faith. And not only are you a son of God, you are the seed of Abraham, Galatians 3, 29. Now we're getting somewhere, aren't we? We're talking about that in the book of Romans. So we have this concept. He is our propitiation, 1 John 2, 2. God is just and justified man in such a way as that he did not conflict with his perfect righteousness. He made a way to justify man in which he remained just himself. Chapter 4. Chapter 4 is a snapshot of the book of Romans, isn't it? Chapter 4 shows the superiority of the gospel to any other system. We have one example. Chapter 4 deals mainly with one man, Abraham. Righteousness is not of the law, for Abraham was deemed righteous before the law. Now, isn't that a logical and reasonable argument? If righteousness were of the law, he's telling these individuals, in this context, in this uh, uh, environment of oppression by Judaism and vehement opposition by these Jews to the gospel, he's saying that righteousness is not of the law. Otherwise, how could Abraham have been deemed righteous before the law was given? But the principle, Romans 3.27b, that is a law of faith. That is how man is justified. That is how man has always been and will always be justified. Obedient faith. Verse 4 says, if it was of works, that is, if Abraham would have kept every jot and tittle perfectly, it would have been of what? Debt. And not of grace. Abraham wasn't perfect, was he? Remember chapter 12? Genesis chapter 12? Remember chapter 20? Remember chapter 21? 
He wasn't perfect. He was far from perfect, but what was he? Faithful. He was obedient. So we have uh, chapter 4, verses 6 through 8. David speaking of the righteousness of a man. Blessed is the man whom his Lord does not reckon sin unto, or that is not sin, uh, sin is not imputed unto him. And blessed is the man whom the Lord reckons righteous. Guess who that man is? The man who is walking faithfully. That is the man who has obedient faith. Verse 12, did that require anything of Abraham? It required him to walk in the steps of that faith. What do we have to do? Walk in the steps of that faith. Isn't that simple? Chapter 5. Therefore, being justified by faith, we have peace with God through our Lord Jesus Christ. We have peace with God through Christ. How do we get in Christ? We're baptized into Christ. Can you have peace with God without being baptized into Christ? No, you can't. Does anyone have peace with God who is not in Christ? Not unless they're an innocent child. So we see now the necessity of being in Christ. Ephesians 3 and verse 6 says, To it the Gentiles are fellow heirs and fellow members of the body and fellow partakers of the promise in Christ Jesus, listen to this, through the gospel. How does one get in Christ? Do you obey the gospel? What does that involve? Baptism into Christ. So we have peace with God through our Lord Jesus Christ and we are justified by what? By, by faith. But verse 9 says, Romans 5 verse 9 says that we are justified by His blood. It's not a contradiction, is it? Because it is by our immediate faith that we contact the blood. Verses 6 through 11, we are absolutely undeserving of what He did for us. While we were yet sinners, verse 8, He died for us. We are saved from wrath through Him. We receive the atonement or the reconciliation through Him. Verses 12 through 21. Comparison of two individuals. Who's that? Adam and Jesus. You ever thought of the similarities between the two? Do you know that Adam was put to sleep and out of his side his bride came? Do you know Jesus Christ died on the cross and out of his side his bride came? John 13, 19, verse 34. When he was on the cross and he was already dead and he was, his side was pierced with a, with a spear and what came forth? Blood and water. That blood purchased his church. Acts 20. Verse 28. So we got the comparison of Adam and Christ. One man, sin entered the world, and death by sin. What kind of sin? Or what kind of death? Excuse me. Spiritual death. And by one man, life entered. Verse 21. What kind of life? Spiritual death. Chapter 6. Know ye not? Or well, what shall we say then? Shall we continue in sin that grace may abound? God forbid. How shall we who are dead to sin live any longer therein? Know ye not, or are ye ignorant, that as many of us who were baptized into Christ were baptized into his death? What happened in that baptism of Paul? Oh, well, you were buried with him. What does that symbolize? Shall we continue in sin that grace may abound? Oh, God forbid. How shall we who were dead to sin live any longer in therein? Not only were you dead, Paul says, you were buried. Not only were you buried, but just as Christ, you were resurrected. What's the result? Walking in newness of life. Second Corinthians 5 and verse 17 says, If any man is in Christ, he's a new creature. The old things are passed away, but all things become new. What is this newness of life? It's a reference to being a new creature. It's a reference to having all sins forgiven. And to being whole and holy and without blemish and unreprovable in Christ. The old man's dead, the new man. Verse 5, in baptism we are planted together with him. That means closely united with. When? Baptism. Before? When we believe? When we hear? When we repent? When we confess? When we're baptized in Christ. That's where we're planted together with him. Verse 16 says, Know ye not that to whom you submit yourself service to obey, his servant you are to whom you obey, whether of sin and to death, or obedience and righteousness. Two choices, right? What is the result of obeying righteousness? What is the result of obeying anything else? Verse 16 covers that, doesn't it? 17, but thanks be to God that raised you were servants of sin. Who's he talking to? Chapter 11, verse 13 says he's the apostle of the Gentiles, and he's speaking to Gentiles. 
They were once what? Ephesians chapter 2 says that they were alienated from the commonwealth of Israel. They were strangers. They were without hope. But thanks be to God that where as you were servants of sin, you become obedient from the heart to that form of teaching. What form? The gospel. What is that form shown? Verses 3 through 5, same chapter. When they obeyed the gospel of Christ, they were made free from sin. And guess what? It required their obedience from the heart. That, that implies understanding. And that implies that intent and motive. What's the result? And having been made free from sin, you became servants of righteousness. Why are they now servants of righteousness? Because they're obeying righteousness. Let no man see you. He that with righteousness is righteous. First John 3 and verse 7. Chapter 7. Chapter 7, the first four verses are an allegory. They're a figure of speech to teach what truth. That the nation of Israel was amenable to the law of Moses until which time that law was done away with. Who gave the law of Moses? God. We talked about Exodus 19 this morning. All I've got to do is flip it over one page in my Bible, Exodus 20. And you have given the Ten Commandments. The law was given by God. Guess who took it away? God. When? It was nailed to the cross of Christ, Colossians 2, and verse 14. God gave it and God took it away. Now the nation of Israel, who was amenable to this law for 15 centuries, guess what? Not anymore. What were they amenable to? For I'm not ashamed of the gospel of Christ, it is the power of God and salvation to how many of those that believe? All those that believe. To the who first? To the Jew first. And also to the Greek. Well, that means that the nation of Israel was no longer amenable to the law of Moses. Nay, rather, they were amenable to the gospel of Christ. And they had to obey. They were now free to do what, verse 4? To marry another. Who's, who could they marry now? He that was resurrected. Who's that? Lazarus? No, no. Jesus the Christ. He that was resurrected never to die again. Re Revelation chapter 1. Verses 14 through 25 of chapter 7, we said, are difficult verses. But if you keep one thought in mind, it makes it a lot easier. Chapter 7, verses 14 through 25, if you believe Paul is speaking present tense of his condition, you're going to be confused. And I'm telling you right now, I've talked to preachers who believe that that is talking about Paul presently and his struggle with sin. Folks, just reason with me. Isaiah 1 verse 18, the Lord says, Come now, let us reason together, saith the Lord. Reason with me, please. Paul just said, the saints in Rome, these aren't apostles in Rome, right? These are Christians in Rome. But they were made free from sin. Chapter 6, verse 17 and 18. But chapter 7, verse 14 says that he is sold under sin. You know what that means? A slave to sin. Was Paul saying that he presently, as an apostle of Christ, was a slave to sin? If these Christians, did Christians have the same office as apostles in those days? Friends, there aren't any apostles today. We're all on equal footing. But the apostles had a special commission. He was free from sin. He wasn't a slave to sin. Do we understand now that Paul isn't saying, verses 18 through 20, that no good thing or sin dwells in him personally when he was writing it? Do you really believe that? No. What is he teaching? Paul is using a literary device to teach something. What is it? That the man outside of Christ, the man under the law, the man then, as opposed to chapter 8, verse 1, there is therefore now no condemnation to those in Christ who walk not after the flesh, but after the Spirit. Chapter 7 deals with the carnal mind, an individual outside of Christ and under the law. Chapter 8 deals with the spiritual mind, an individual in Christ. This individual, verses 2 and 3, is free from the law of sin and death. Do you know what that law is? He says in verse 3, that's the law of Moses. Why is it called the law of sin and death? Because that's what it produced. How? Because they failed to keep it. It was a standard, right? Verse number 6 sums up chapter 8 nicely. The first half, for to be carnally minded is death, but to be spiritually minded is life and peace. Verse 16 says, for the Spirit himself bears witness with our spirit that we are the children of God. Beginning in verse 28 through verse 39, you have wonderful, wonderful hope. For who? All 39 chapters of, or all 39 verses of chapter 8 deal with one kind of person, spiritually minded. Chapter 
14 through 20, or verse 14 through 25 of chapter 7 deal with one kind of person. There's a difference. Chapter 9. Now we start to turn to chapter 9 through chapter 11, and Paul is now dealing with the nation of Israel, and he's still writing to the same people. Who's that? Saints in Rome. Now what? Uh, he's sorrowful. Wow. He's sorrowful because his kinsmen, according to the flesh, are they benefiting? Are they characterized in chapter 8 or chapter 7? The nation of Israel is characterized by those in chapter 7. Carnally minded, outside of Christ, but under the law. And what does he say about them in chapter 10? They need saved. He's sorrowful for them. He begins to turn now, verses 6 through 8 of chapter 9, and he begins to turn and he's starting to display an important point, and that is that not all Israel are of Israel. Just because you're of the physical lineage of Abraham, just because you're of the physical lineage, does not make you a seed of promise. Now we start to go towards the inclusion of the Gentiles. And this is his stepping stone to that. He says that God was not unrighteous for choosing the lineage of Jacob over Esau. Why? Because God knew them. He knew what their, their, their lineage would do. And he chose the lineage of Jacob over the lineage of Esau. He wasn't unrighteous for that. And guess what? The Jews didn't gripe about it. But the Jews will gripe about the inclusion of the Gentiles. Was God unrighteous for doing that? Of course he wasn't. He introduces two prophets in this chapter. And he'll introduce one more in the next. That spoke of the inclusion of the Gentiles into the new covenant. Who was that? Hosea and Isaiah. Verses 25 and 27. Chapter 10 and verse 1 says what? That his heart's desire for them is that they be saved. We ask the question all the time, if someone needs saving, are they saved? Of course not. But I thought that God's chosen people were the nation of Israel. The physical nation. Well, you thought wrong. The truth of the matter is, God's people are the spiritual Israel. Philippians 3 and verse 3, we are the circumcision who worship God in the spirit. Galatians 6 and verse 16, blessed be the Israel of God, that is the church of Christ. We are God's people. There is no chosen physical people today, but we are chosen spirits. That's only in the church. Now in chapter 10, he says in verses 2 through 4, that the nation of Israel, rather than submitting to the gospel of Christ, they did what? They were ignorant of it, and they kept trying to establish their own righteousness. That's a reference to keeping the law. All they had to do, verse 8, the word of faith was nigh them. All they had to do was obey it. Verses 9 through 14. He introduces one more prophet now, Moses, to speak of the inclusion of the Gentiles in this new covenant. Having outlined those, let's look in chapter 11, and let's briefly go through and we'll get into the text tonight. Chapter 11. God not cast away all of Israel because Paul was among the remnant. Verse 1. There has always been a remnant. Verses 2 through 4. The remnant now are those Jews that obeyed the gospel, and others would continue to be burdened with the dead law as long as they try to keep it. Verses 5 through 10. The casting off of the nation of Israel would mean that other nations would be able to enjoy a covenant relationship with God. Verses 11 and following. The preaching of the gospel to the Gentiles was intended to save some of the Jews who would be provoked to jealousy, verse 14. Those who submitted to the gospel would be received, verse 15, just as the first fruit was, verse 16, and that's a reference to the Jews who obeyed the gospel in the very beginning. And they would all be partakers of the fullness of the olive tree, verse 17. That is, all in one body, Ephesians 2, 16. Obedience to the gospel gave no one reason to boast, especially the Gentiles, verse 18, because of their lineage. They could be cast off just as the nation of Israel was, verses 19 through 21. Both sides of the nature of God are on display, goodness and severity, verse 22. Those branches and all branches, or any branches, could be grafted in again if they were obedient, or broken off if rebellious, verses 23 through 24. So much for once saved, always saved. The deliverer out of Zion, verse 26, that's Jesus, would save all the faithful, that is spiritual Israel, verse 25. They, spiritual Israel, would benefit from the new covenant having their sins forgiven, verse 27. The rebellious Jews were enemies of the gospel, verse 28, but this would not cause God to change his mind about offering redemption through this lineage, that is the elect, verse 29. All men stand condemned by their own actions, thus God could offer redemption to all through Christ, verses 30 through 32. 
The marvelous knowledge of God is seen in his plan to redeem man, and it is truly uncomprehendable. Verse 33. Verse 34. For who hath known the mind of the Lord, or who hath been his counselor? The only things we can truly know of God's plans or dealings is if it is revealed to us. But it is written, I have not seen nor ear heard, neither hath entered into the heart of man the things which God hath prepared for them that love him. But God revealed them unto us by his Spirit. For the Spirit searcheth all things, yea, the deep things of God. For what man knoweth the things of a man, save the Spirit of man which is in him? Even so, the things of God knoweth no man, but the Spirit of God. Now we have received, not the Spirit of the world, but the Spirit which is of God, that we might know the things that are freely given to us of God. Which things also we speak, not in the words which man's wisdom teaches, but which the Holy Ghost teaches, comparing spiritual things with spiritual. Now again, don't be confused. You're not being taught anything by the Holy Spirit today unless it's through this word. That was then. In the first century, the Holy Spirit was given, John 14 through 16, John 14, 23, John 16, verse uh, number 8. He was given to teach them and reveal this truth to them. And that's exactly what you have here. God revealed it through His Spirit to man. This... Verse 34 is a quote from Isaiah 40, verse 13. Who hath directed the Spirit of the Lord, or being his counselor, hath taught him? All nations before him are as nothing, and they are counted to him less than nothing in vanity. To whom then will you liken God? Or what likeness will you compare unto him? Isaiah 40, 17 and 18. Can you imagine the, the thought of, of a counselor and advisor? For he that is omniscient, how silly. Continue to notice. Isaiah 40, beginning of verse 22. It is he that sitteth upon the circle of the earth, and the inhabitants thereof are as grasshoppers, that stretcheth out the heavens as a curtain, and spreadeth them out as a tent to dwell in, that bringeth the princes to nothing, he maketh the judges of the earth as vanity. Yea, they shall, uh, they shall not be planted, yea, they shall not be sown, yea, their stock shall not take root in the earth, and he shall also blow upon them, and they shall wither, and the whirlwind shall take them away as stubble. To whom then will ye liken me, or shall I be equal, saith the Holy One? Lift up your eyes on high, and behold, who hath created these things, that bringeth out their host by number. He calleth them all by names, by the greatness of his might. For that he is strong in power, not one faileth. Why sayest thou, O Jacob, and speakest, O Israel, my way is hid from the Lord, and my judgment is passed over from my God? Hast thou not known? Hast thou not heard? That the everlasting God, the Lord, the creator of the ends of the earth, fainteth not, neither is weary? There is no searching of his understanding. The infinite mind of God. Paul asked the question rhetorically. Who has been his counselor? Who has advised him? Who has given him this advice? Who taught him? We said one of the implications of omniscience is, is never has God learned anything. Think about that. Never has God learned anything new. The very concept of knowing all is that nothing else can be known. Who has advised him? We can know of his eternal nature by what he has created. As a matter of fact, those in the old days were said to be without excuse. For the invisible things of him from the creation of the world are clearly seen, being understood by the things that are made, even his eternal power and Godhead, so that they are without excuse. In Hebrews chapter 3 it says... All houses are built by some man. God is the builder of all things. We recognize that principle that something now is, something has always been. That is a problem our evolutionary friends have to try to deal with, and they can't do it. If ever there was nothing, there would still be nothing. However, we recognize that there has always been something, and that something is God. And He is eternal. And He is the great cause of all that we see today. We can understand what God reveals to us in this way. We have a knowledge of Him. And in this way only can we know the mind of the Lord. I was reading Brother Frank Chester's book last night. The Spirit of Liberalism under the topic that liberalism doesn't tremble. We spoke about that a little this morning. But he was saying and I absolutely agree with him. It's always wise to agree with someone very knowledgeable like he is. But I'm convicted that it's truth myself. He had said something to this effect. That the Bible is the mind of God revealed to man. 
Now, in 1 Samuel 2.35, God is speaking to Eli about his sons, Phineas and Hophni, and their desecration and profaning the sacrifice and all the wickedness that they did. And he's telling Eli that he's going to cut off his family, and he says that I'm going to raise up a priest that will do all that is in my heart. How in the world could a priest do all that is in God's heart? That's easy. God revealed it to him. God would tell him what to do, and the priest would do it, and therefore he would do all that is in God's heart. All the things that are in God's what, 1 Corinthians 2? His mind. And that's what we're talking about. This is the only way we can know the mind of the Lord. We can't grasp it. Friends, if you think you can, read Job, beginning in verse 38, and bring me next week, bring me the answers to those questions. I will demand of thee, saith the Lord. Gird up thy loins like a man, he said, and answer if thou knowest. Proverbs chapter 2, verses 2 through 6 say, So that thou incline thine ear unto wisdom, and apply thine heart to understanding. Yea, if thou criest after knowledge, and liftest up thy voice for understanding, if thou seekest her as silver, and searchest for her as for hid treasures, then thou shalt understand the fear of the Lord, and find the knowledge of God. For the Lord giveth wisdom, out of his mouth cometh knowledge and understanding. Isn't that what he's given us right here? We have all things that pertain to the life of God in this 2 Peter 1, 3. The word of God makes us complete, thoroughly furnished into every good work, 2 Timothy 3, 17. We have all that we need. Who has been his counselor? He is the source. Do we not understand that? That he is the very source of wisdom? He is the source of knowledge. He is the source of purity and holiness and righteousness. He is the source of love. He is the source of these things. And you're telling me someone could advise him? That's absurd. For unto us a child is born. Isaiah, who's he talking about? Jesus. Isaiah 9 verse 6. Unto us a child is born. Unto us a son is given. And the government shall be upon his shoulder. And his name shall be called Wonderful Counselor. The Mighty God. The Everlasting Father. The Prince of Peace. Now, I put that in there to establish one thing. In terms of counseling, God is the supreme counselor. No one counsels God, but God gives counsel. He gave knowledge in the Old Testament, and he had filled them with the Spirit of God in wisdom and understanding and in knowledge, and with all manner of workmanship, Exodus 35 and verse 31. And Joshua the son of Nun was full of the spirit of wisdom, for Moses laid his hand upon him, and the children of Israel hearkened unto him as the, and did as the Lord commanded Moses, Deuteronomy 34, in verse 9. He gave knowledge then. He gave knowledge in the New Testament time, the first century. Notice. For to one is given by the Spirit the word of wisdom, and to another the word of knowledge by the same Spirit. Spiritual gifts were given to this end, weren't they? To to reveal truth and to confirm it with power. That the God of our Lord Jesus Christ, the Father of glory, may give unto you the spirit of wisdom and revelation and knowledge of Him, the eyes of your understanding being enlightened, that you may know what is the hope of His calling and what the riches of the glory of His inheritance in the saints. Ephesians 1. Now, if you've ever read Ephesians chapter 1, verse 13, and you're confused about what the sealing of the Holy Spirit is, that's it. It was miraculous. It's not for you today. It was miraculous. And it dealt with them. And it confirms even to us today, 2,000 years later, that God is able to do these things. So you have. He gave them this revelation and this knowledge and wisdom through these spiritual gifts. Verse 35. Or who hath first given to him, and it shall be recompensed unto him again. This is a loose quote from Job 41, verse 11. Now let me ask you a question. Anyone familiar with Job 41? Who's being dealt with in that chapter? Job is speaking about the most fearsome creature to ever walk this earth. And guess what? Yes, he did live on this earth. Leviathan. Not behemoth of Job 40, but Leviathan, a fierce creature. Who hath prevented me that I should repay him? Whatsoever is under the whole heaven is mine. God is making a point. He's saying that man's fears bounce off of Leviathan as if it was nothing. He accounts them as straw, as stubble. Smoke bellows out of his nose and fire from his mouth, and he is a fierce creature. None can stand before him. And if God has absolute control over him and none can stand before Leviathan, who can stand before me, God said. Now, how would that be understood by Job if Leviathan wasn't an actual creature?
God is the giver of all good things. Every good gift and perfect gift is from above and cometh down from the Father of lights, with whom is no variables. He does not change, neither shadow of turning. Of his own will begot he us with the word of truth. Of his own will begot he us how? By the word of truth, James. <coughs> Reference 1 Peter 1.23. That we should be a kind of first, uh, first fruits of his creature. If he is the source and the cause, who has given to him that he could recompense them? None. Who hath delivered us out of the power of darkness and translated us into the kingdom of the Son of His glory, and who we have redemption and forgiveness of our sins? Who is the image of the invisible God, the firstborn of all creation? For in Him were all things created in the heavens and upon the earth, things visible and things invisible, whether thrones or dominions or principalities or powers. All things have been created through Him and unto Him and used before all things. And in Him all things consist. Colossians 1, 13 through 17. Who? Jesus Christ. Jesus Christ is the eternal word, John 1, verse 1. He is, he is he who brought forth all things. He is the creator. And thou, Lord, in the beginning hast laid the foundations of the earth and the heavens are the works of thy hands. They shall perish, but thou remainest. Jesus Christ, the eternal word, Hebrews chapter 1. No one was before and none shall be after. Hear my witnesses, saith the Lord, my servant whom I have chosen, that you may know and believe me and understand that I am he. Before me there was no God for. Neither shall it be after. I and I am Jehovah. Besides me there is no Savior. Isaiah 43, 10 and 11. Who is like unto thee, O Lord, among the gods? Who is like thee, glorious in holiness, fearful in praises, doing wonders? Exodus 15 and verse 11. The Song of Moses. Sung on the shores of the Red Sea with the bodies of the Egyptians washing up at their feet. Who is like unto thee? The vast army of Pharaoh that would crush any man was no match for God. Who is like unto me? Verse 36. For of him, and through him, and to him, are all things to whom be glory forever. God is the creator of all. Praise ye the Lord. Praise ye the Lord from the heavens. Praise him in the heights. Praise ye him, all his angels. Praise ye him, all his hosts. <coughs> Praise ye him, sun and moon. Praise him, all the stars of light. Praise him, ye heaven of heavens, and ye waters that are above the heavens. Let them praise the name of the Lord, for he commanded, and they were created. Sometimes it's probably the case that we lose sight of who we serve. That was what this morning's lesson was all about. Do you understand, folks, that he, by the, as Frank Chester said, by the gentle movement of his mind, all things were created. Folks, this is power that cannot fully be comprehended by man. Amen. But he commanded, and they were. That is infinite power. He created all things for him, of him. He is the source. All things are of him as he is the source of all. And he is before all things. And in him, or by him, all things consist. Colossians 1, 17. But of him are ye in Christ who of God is made unto us wisdom and righteousness and sanctification and redemption, 1 Corinthians 1 verse 3. Who is he talking to? Church in Corinth, 1 Corinthians 1 verse 2. The church. But to us there is but one God, the Father, of whom are all things, and we in him, and one Lord Jesus Christ, by whom are all things, and we by him, 1 Corinthians 8 and verse 6. Paul talking to those in Athens. In Acts chapter 17, he says as much. That God is the creator of all things. And in him we live and breathe and have all being. Mm -hmm. Whoso offereth praise glorifieth me and to him that ordereth his conversation aright will I show the salvation of God. Why not put that in there? The salvation is of God. Of him he is the source. Through him he is the initiator. Jesus Christ, the eternal word, through him, he created all things. He is the cause, the initiator, and the administrator of all that is. Before the mountains were brought forth, or ever thou hast formed the earth and the world, even from everlasting to everlasting, thou art God. Psalm 90, verse 10. They sacrificed unto devils, not to God, to gods whom they knew not, to new gods that came up newly. 
whom your fathers feared not at the rock that begat thee, thou art mind, unmindful, thou hast forgotten that God formed thee. Deuteronomy 22, 17 and 18. For the Lord is a great God and the King above all gods. In his hand are the deep places of the earth, the strength of the hills is his also. The sea is his, and he made it. And his hands formed the dry land. Oh, come, let us worship and bow down. Let us kneel before the Lord, our Maker. And all the inhabitants of the earth are reputed as nothing. And he doeth according to his will in the armies of heaven. And among the inhabitants of the earth, and none can stain his hand nor say unto him, What doest thou? Daniel 4, verse 35. To him. Of him. To him. That is for his glory. I will say to the north, give up, to the south, keep not back. Bring my sons from far, my daughters from the end of the earth. Everyone that is called by my name, whom I have created for my glory, whom I have formed, yea, whom I have made. Of him. Why was man created? For his glory. Mm -hmm. Folks, if you're confused about what should be important in your life, I can solve that for you really quick. You're created to glorify God. Your duty is to fear God and keep His commandments. Please, yes, these 12, 13. That should be first and foremost in your life. Everything else will actually fall into place if you do what you're supposed to do very often. Yes, we will suffer some things, but we better recognize what's most important. Mm -hmm. All things, all was created by Him. In the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word was God. The same was in the beginning with God. All things were made by Him, and without Him was not anything made that was made. John 1, 1 through 3. Man above all was created to glorify God. Let us hear the conclusion of the whole matter. Fear God and keep His commandments, for this is the whole duty of man. For God shall bring every work into judgment with every secret thing, whether it be good or whether it be evil. Ecclesiastes 12, 13, 14. We can only glorify God by doing His will. That is why Paul said the glory to God is given in the church. Ephesians 3, verse 21. There is nothing that we can give him that is not already his. Mm -hmm. Think about this. Think about this, bringing us into next week. There is nothing that we can advise God. There is nothing that has been given to him that he has to repay for. There is nothing that we can give him that is not already his. Mm -hmm. But one thing. Our loving devotion. Us using our free will to choose to serve him even if it's difficult. That is what he expects. And that is what we can give. Now, think about that and listen to these two verses that we'll look at beginning next week. I beseech you, therefore, brethren, by the mercies of God, that you present your bodies a living sacrifice, holy, acceptable unto God, which is your reasonable or spiritual service. And be not conformed to this world, but be ye transformed by the renewing of your mind, that you may prove what is that good and acceptable and perfect will of God. Romans 12. I'd like to extend the invitation at this time. If there are any who have never obeyed the gospel of Christ, I would invite you to do so today. Today is the day. Now is the day of salvation. You have no idea whether you're going to live another one or not. If you die this night, will you be ready? Will you be able to confidently step into eternity knowing that the Lord is your shepherd? You shall not walk. Can you say it confidently? If not, why not? There's no reason why you can't know. Romans 8, 16. Hear the word of God. Believe it. John 6 and verse 29, it is the work of God to believe on him whom he has sent. You believe on him through his word, John 20, 30 and 31. Believe it and repent of your sins. Change your mind about what you're doing and change your actions. Confess Christ before men, Matthew 10, 32, 33. Be baptized for the remission of sins based upon this truth. Understanding this truth. Be baptized into Christ wherein are all spiritual blessings, including the forgiveness of sins, Ephesians 1, 3 through 7. Be thou faithful, even if it costs you your life. Revelation 2 and verse 2. For those who have obeyed the gospel of Christ, perhaps it is the case that you have something in your life that needs to be made right. Examine yourself. There's no reason why we can't confidently affirm and know exactly where we stand with God. If we are walking in the light, if we are faithful and continuing in the gospel, Colossians 1.23, we know where we stand. But if there's something in your life that needs to be, uh, needs to be made right, won't you consider that? Won't you acknowledge your sin to God and repent? And He will forgive you. If you need the prayers of the church, if you sin in a public way, we'll pray for you. That's why we're here. We want to all go to heaven together. Consider your condition tonight as we sing this invitation song. If you have any need, we invite you to come forward now as we stand.